voices in education policy, former Florida Governor Jeb Bush, and US Secretary, former U.S. Secretary of Education Margaret Spellings. Governor Bush served for two terms in Florida from 99 to 07. Under his leadership, Florida established a bold accountability system in its public schools and created the most ambitious school choice program in the country. Today, Florida remains a national leader in education and is one of the only states in this country that has narrowed um, those significant achievement gaps that you hear about. After leaving office, Governor Bush launched the Foundation for Excellence in Education, which focuses on educational quality, innovation, and opportunity. Excel in Ed, as it's commonly known to those of us in the ed policy world, advances a broad range of student-centered policy solutions that focus on increasing student learning, advancing equity, and ensuring that graduates are ready for college and career. And of course, we're always pleased to welcome back Margaret Spellings to the Bush Center, where she served as the president from 2013 to 16. During her time here, among other things, she led the formation of our, our landmark Presidential Leadership Scholars Program. Secretary Spellings also served as the president of the 17 institution University of North Carolina system from 2016 to 19. And of course, the highlight of her exceptional career in public service came when she was nominated by President Bush and confirmed by the U.S. Senate in 2005 to serve as our U.S. Secretary of Education. There, she led the implementation of the, of the bipartisan No Child Left Behind Act, an initiative to provide greater accountability for the education of the nearly 50 million kids who are in public education here in the U.S. As secretary, she also launched the Commission on the Future of Higher Education, a plan to address the challenges of access, affordability, quality, and accountability in our nation's colleges and universities. And by the way, as secretary, this is very important, she also appeared on Celebrity Jeopardy. I confirmed with her that she did not win, but she came in second, so she did well. Um, in President Bush's first term, Margaret was the White House domestic policy advisor, and these days she is the CEO of Texas 2036, a nonpartisan, nonprofit policy center dedicated to offering data-based solutions um, that will ensure by our state's uh, uh, bicentennial, 2036, that Texas will remain the very best place to live and work in the country. And I can't think of a better person to lead this conversation than Holly Kuzmich, who's beginning her ninth year as the executive director of the Bush Institute. We lent Holly to Harvard this fall. She served as a resident fellow um, for the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School. Her policy experience also includes senior roles at the White House, the U.S. Department of Education, and the U.S. Capitol. And she worked on the development and implementation of the No Child Left Behind Act, signed into law 20 years ago. If you ask her about January 8th, 2012, she knows that date well when it was signed, and she could tell you all about what it was like to see that come together. So please join me in welcoming Governor Jeb Bush, Secretary Margaret Spellings, and the Bush Institute's Holly Kuzmich. Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here. Governor Bush, Margaret, it's nice to have two education stalwarts in the building tonight. We have lots to talk about. Um, there's plenty in the news on this topic. Uh, there's, the education has come up in the governor's race that we saw in Virginia yeah. this fall. We'll talk a little bit about that. But of course, one of the things um, that I also want to recognize is that this month is the 20th anniversary of the No Child Left Behind Act. And um, there's a lot of people in this room, actually, who worked on that law. We've got a lot of old friends in the room tonight. Thank you all for being here. Um, we just had a meeting a little bit earlier today on some of the current issues in education. What have we learned over the past 20 years? How well are we doing or not? So thank you all for being here. We've got several of them seated down here. Um, but, you know, I, I want to talk to you both a little bit about what, what we've learned in these 20 years. No Child Left Behind, for the people who, who don't know a lot about what that law espoused, it was about measurement, annual assessments and reading and math in grades three through eight and once in high school. It was about disaggregating that data so that you couldn't hide in the averages. It was about a level of accountability, states having to put in place accountability systems and have some level of consequences for schools not meeting their annual targets. Um, but Margaret, I'll start with you, since you, uh, you worked for then Governor Bush, not this Governor Bush, the other Governor Bush, when he was Governor <laughs> of Texas. 
um, and worked with him on the campaign and then came into the White House with him and really helped shape that law. You know, what, what really worked about that law um, and what, what has not worked as well about that law as you reflect over 20 years? Well, uh, it's great to be back at the Bush Center and thank you, Holly, for, uh, for hosting us. And Ken, always great to see you, Governor my fellow comrade in arms on education. Clarification, am I gonna to have to answer in the form of a question given the Jeopardy <laughs> experience? I just wanna get that out, because it's a little trickier to do. Here's what we got right, and, and here's where, we were just talking back in the green room, politicians can't say they made a mistake. We got something wrong. So I might break that, that rule a little bit tonight. But listen, and I'm proud uh, to say that the, the core elements of this law stand today on the books as part of our federal construct, annual assessment, disaggregated data, uh, reporting it, and you know, uh, with this idea, two big ideas. One, we ought to get something for the massive amount of federal money we spend, especially now, uh, for our students, especially poor and minority and disadvantaged students. Uh, and, and secondly, that uh, you know, we have a, a moral imperative, a clarion call, a civil right, uh, because the whole Department of Education was birthed as part of that, to really see about the needs of every single student, period, full stop. And so the, those principles stand to this day. Um, you know, in subsequent reauthorizations, we've now gotten lost in the fine print that have uh, you know, come under the guise of local control, which Republicans used to be for, now not so much, we'll probably get into that. But, you know, we've manipulated the fine print so there's less really muscle around accountability over time. Um, I will say, and I'll just use Texas as an example, it's my favorite quote to say, we went from being 33rd in the nation uh, in uh, 2000 or so, uh, to f 47th today, and that's just not an accident. You know, when people are paying attention to poor minority kids and, and accountability muscle and all of that, you know, it makes for better policy and better things. So uh, that's what we got right. What we got wrong is, uh, you know, c too much kind of one size fits all. I remember, you know, we were, we were in a little bit of a battle in the early days of No Child Left Behind on Florida. And Florida was way ahead of the game. I'll let the governor tell that story, but. Uh, I forgive you now. <laughs> <laughs> it's our anniversary, honey. <laughs> uh, so anyway, you know, some, some missed starts on implementation, but for the most part, you know, I'd do it again. Yeah. Governor, you, you were governor at the time that this yeah. came into place, but you were already working on a lot of these things. So it put you in a little bit of an awkward position with your brother as president, and you already sort of doing the work that other states weren't doing. Well, I, you could say that about the entire <laughs> six years where he was president and I was governor. It's, awkward is an understatement. I don't think there's ever, just for the record here, I don't think I ever said anything critical about President George W. Bush. Um, and I thought about Publicly. it a lot, you know, I mean, <laughs> the administration is, never gets it perfect in the eyes of, right. of governors, for sure, but um, I was very loyal, so I kept my mouth shut and we had our arguments privately about it, but I, when I ran, um, I took what George did as governor and Jim Hunt mm -hmm. as governor of North Carolina, I would say those are the two states that had the most focused approach to accountability and tried to put it on steroids. And then the legislature thankfully went along with it and so we had our accountability system in place and it created conflicts of course because ours was very different um, we had learned, you know, a bunch of nerdy reasons why it was different. And you could get to a point where our school in Florida would be a B or an A, and it would be what, whatever the bad term was for the No Child Left Behind. Not like, making adequate yearly progress. Yeah. It sucked. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and ultimately, in 10 years, every school would, would be, you know, failing because you wouldn't have every kid. To the absolute. Yeah, you know, so it, it, it was, a, that was probably, if I had to pick one thing that, that there was an expectation, I'm sure, that there was gonna be modifications of that going mm -hmm. forward. But here's, here's the good part. The good part was, if you saw that picture, you had some of the most liberal members of the, of the Congress with John Boehner, and who else was on the Republican? Ted Kennedy, George Miller. George Miller, who was Judd the other? Judd Gregg. Judd Gregg, yeah. You know, solid con traditional conservatives, 
led by the president, Margaret and others, uh, in a bipartisan fashion, passing a bill that was desperately needed, I'd say, in almost all states. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, if you're in California, where they still have, like, their accountability system is based on a color coding, you know, mauve, you know, like <laughs> purple, all the California colors. So they're kind of like, oh, it's, it's a spectrum, you know, you have no clue whether your you know, mauve is a good school or a bad school. <laughs> That's how they play out there, that's how they roll. And so this accountability system was an eat, eat your broccoli moment to use a Bush expression. Sure. And, yeah. those, and there was no accountability in most states. Yeah. Huh. So it forced states to do what they should have been doing already. And that's, that still exists today. If you didn't have No Child Left Behind, it would get ugly real quick. It's Amen. kind of slow, it, there, there's a slow ugly roll right now, but it's not, it, it wouldn't, the, the, the success we've had, and there has been some, wouldn't have happened. So. Kudos to the to the work. And, and and you know this, Holly, because I, I looked at my little thing today. The, that law passed the United States Senate 87 to 10, and I think 431 to 18 in the House. Wow. This is a piece of legislation that affects you know 50 million school children. Blah blah blah. Anyway, they can't pass that to adjourn for lunch today. So, <laughs> you know, just it was a monumental, monumental political achievement, uh, and it wasn't an accident. And, no, and there was a lot of effort that went behind that. Right, exactly. Yeah. But it was also a moment in our country where that was the expectation. And when I think back on it, I mean, we did it in D.C. parlance in just breakneck pace of it took a year. You know, it takes a lot longer to do stuff now, as right. everyone can see. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about tests and accountability since that time. So you just talked about the, the wide margins with which it passed. And I think a lot of people believe in accountability and assessments. It was a little bit of a theoretical discussion, right? Like we're gonna do this, but it, we've got a couple years until the assessments go into place until we start identifying schools. And that started to change some of the conversation around assessments and accountability because suddenly people saw their neighborhood school, you know, getting a grade or, you know, getting a, a, a designation that they didn't realize that the school wasn't necessarily doing well, and we've seen a lot of pushback on assessment. Um, you know, what, what are we sort of up against now, 20 years later on those two topics, or what's happening out there on these issues? Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, we couldn't have passed, if people actually knew what this was gonna mean in their schools and communities, we probably couldn't have passed it 87 to 10, because, you know, it, it clearly exposed, you know, these incredible gaps, we had this, put the money out and hope for the best strategy prior to that. And all of a sudden, you know, and to you know, you've got the numbers in front of you now. I mean, half our kids can't read at grade level, folks. I mean, if half the planes that took off from DFW today didn't land or half the meals served in the restaurant you just came from, I mean, we'd be outraged. But anyway, so they didn't really fully appreciate the muscle that it was gonna, uh, Governor Jeb Bush appreciated it. Uh, and understood it, but mostly people did not. So I think uh, two things happened. One, this got personal to grown-ups, adults, those beloved teachers. All of a sudden, you know, we can't have this, none of the kids can read, but all the teachers are great kind of thing. It kind of causes one to wonder. Uh, so, I mean, that kind of stuff started to accelerate. I mean, I'm just saying. Uh, and, and the heat got too hot for, for the politics. What are you seeing in Florida, Governor? Um, there's been a pushback against uh, testing, but it's, it's, if you ask people, should we assess where kids stand? Should there be a, a, a true accountability of where, where students are? Uh, across the board, affluent parent, parents, poor parents from you know, lower income, black, Hispanic, white, they all say yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do, you, how do you rectify that and not over test? or not you know, do remediation so you're, you're teaching to a test to be able to learn testing skills rather than learning how to read and, and math. And there's ways to do that. Um, and, and we should focus on that, to be clear. What I'm, I'm, my biggest frustration, and the foundation folks, Excel and Ed folks will, will tell you this, is you know, we're living in 2021, man, or 2022, and the testing is the same as it existed yeah. like in 1980. It drives me nuts. And you know, there's like six psychometricians that control this whole deal. And I'm, I'm like, I think there's probably someone in Miami or Silicon Valley or somewhere that could probably come up with a test where you could 
determine the, you know, where, where a kid stands, get it back in the hands of a teacher and a parent so that there could be not just an awareness of where they are at a given point in time, but a strategy on how to rectify their deficiencies and make this something that is actually part of the learning experience mm -hmm. rather than just a, and, and an end of course exam in Florida is given in March. Right. Like the, end of, the school doesn't end in March. It ends for a lot of kids in March because they've already taken the test, so they, you know, they're watching movies and stuff. So mm -hmm. figuring out how to get the test at the end, being able to give it to the teacher, being able to see where teachers are, are doing well and doing poorly, giving it to parents the minute it happens, and give it to the next year's teacher, that would be a better policy that would garner tremendous support because the underlying accountability still is, is supported by parents now that they know that their little Johnny you know, can't, can't read worth a squat. Mm -hmm. They want to know what's, what are you going to do about it now? Yeah. And that's, that's the benefit of accountability and certainly No Child Left Behind created that, that, um, that awareness. You know, I think, I mean, this is one silver lining, I hate to call it that, hard lesson of, of COVID is, you know, this online experience. I mean, Texas and others, I mean, t tests are now starting to be developed online with, you know, more yeah. r um, rapid feedback and all that sort of stuff. So we're in a, in a journey around that. But, you know, there's this myth, I want everybody to know this, all this high stakes testing. The only stakes around testing are that the kid can't read and will not be able to function in life. There isn't, you know, nothing happens if you're if the kid fails the test. Well, in Florida, if you, you know, if you, in Texas, anyway. if you fail twice, you know, if you get an F, if most your kids can't read, eventually the school is going to be graded F, and your parents, you know, can go to a higher performing public school. And right now they can go to private schools anyway. So, right, it, it, you know, there's if, if you empower parents yeah. and you give them transparency, you give them information, you're going to create better public schools, and all schools will benefit. That I don't think. That has been disproven by accountability. I think it's been enhanced. Absolutely. And we need to get more people actually energized about this rather than focusing on these, I'm sure we'll talk about it because that's the topic du jour, these narrowly focused uh, political issues that don't relate to yeah. whether a kid can read in third grade because that, that should be the highest priority for all of us. Um, if you want to limit government as a conservative, make sure a kid is, is a grade level reader when they get out of third grade. If you believe in social justice as a conservative or a liberal, make sure that they can read because if they don't, those gaps grow exponentially immediately. And I, you know, but you have to actually make that case and you have to get on the, on the playing field and argue for it. And right now, you know, Democrats are supporting the, the adults in the system for the economic interests, their economic interests. And you know, conservatives are reactionary right now rather than um, advancing a cause that is righteous. Because it is, it's really righteous. Absolutely. And you win, you know, you win elections by bringing people towards your cause rather than saying how bad the other guys are. But wouldn't you say that, I mean, you were elected governor because you talked about education. I mean, it was the defining, yeah. you were an education governor, period. Yeah. So was your brother. It, um, it became the issue. I, wasn't even, I, was, I was not the incumbent, but my plan, which I laid out in the campaign, became the, the issue and I was attacked on it. And I won whether that was the reason I won or not. I claimed it. Yeah, it seemed like it was pretty Heck, good politics. You know, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's politics 101. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Declare a mandate and move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and you did. Okay, so, so obviously the past couple years during COVID, and assessments have really been affected. There were real operational challenges mm -hmm. in that spring of 2020, right? When, when everybody turned to sort of virtual schooling. Um, but those calls for, you know, no more, and people, states had to put a pause on assessments, but there have continued to be calls for no assessments. Um, so how, you know, to this issue of we need to get more sophisticated about how we test our students, but we also just are fighting this battle of do we even test kids? How do we move forward in an environment like that? Uh, in Texas, we're going to go at least two years without any statewide testing and four years without school ratings, which we finally adopted in Texas about a year of playbook. Um, so, you know, a lot of murkiness around that. I like to say we need to care enough to find out. And so I think we have to take the moral high ground back and say, listen, we can't solve a problem, help your kid, if we don't know where your kid is. And so. Uh, I don't know, that's, that's not an answer to the question. How do we get it back in the barn? We gotta rebuild the political imperative that the governor just talked about. Well, you gotta have, uh, up till now at least, Washington has been pretty good about not allowing mm -hmm. states to do this. And you know, I'm pleased that President Biden's administration did that, President Trump's did it as well. So yeah. hopefully that continues to be the case. Um, look, 
I, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. I always tell this story. When I was can a candidate in 98, I went to a remedial class. Back then we had a statewide test for graduation. We were so, everybody was so proud of it. It's an eighth grade level test. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the question was, this kid was, he had his last chance, he'd failed it four times, last chance to take it. He'd been a kid, a student through the, you know, K through 12, he was in 12th grade. Baseball game starts at three, it ends in, at 4.30, how long's the game? Now the wise ass people here say nine innings, um, but you know, the, the right answer, the Jeopardy answer is what is an hour and 30 minutes? And this, could, this kid couldn't answer it. And so, you know, you, get, you have to have robust accountability, not just test and not, ha not, not, not for it to be meaningful. Because who, who could argue uh, on behalf of a system that generated that result? Mm -hmm. It's immoral. Yeah. It's totally immoral. And we had, we had a 50% graduation rate in Florida in 1998. 50%. Yeah. With incredibly low standards. Mm -hmm. So high expectations and mean it. And, and stick with it is really important. And, and it, it sadly has waned across the country. Mm -hmm. You know, Governor, I'm sorry, Han, uh, can I ask a question? Do you think we have, you know, this, this whole idea, this moral imperative, this idea that we can and we should and we must, has that gone away? Do people just not, you don't hear a lot of talking about that anymore. I think our politics has become pretty one dimensional. One side is, you know, the, the fights are about the marginal things, yeah. uh, with a lot of a lot of emotion, a lot of energy. Um, but these foundational issues need to become. I think, you know, Governor Youngkin. I, I would give him credit for making the press covered it as though this was all about critical race theory. But he talked about the broader issues of, uh, particularly in the pandemic. This is a huge opportunity to re-energize the reform movement mm -hmm. because parents now have seen. Yeah. You know, the, the abject neglect. I mean, you, the, the McKinsey did a study that shows that the learning loss in uh, uh, 2020, 2021 was five months. It's hard to, you know, there's only, what? Nine. Seven, nine <laughs> months of yeah. school. Yeah. So, and it's you know, probably gotten worse since then. Right. It has. And so some districts basically have shut down their schools. Chicago would be a good example of that. Others have stayed open and the, those gaps, while they exist, will, will be narrowed. So I think this is where, you know, to take this emotion and this, the parental energy uh, and expand it to a broader reform agenda is really the real opportunity. I wish Democrats would embrace this too and make it a competitive thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want my party to win. I'm, this is not a partisan place, so I'll keep my mouth shut, but I'd love to see a more positive, hopeful, aggressive reform agenda because parents get it now. Totally. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, first of all, on the issue of kids and the and the learning loss that we're seeing, you know, what are we going to do about? What should we be doing about this immediately in the next mm -hmm. few years? Because these kids are losing lots of you know time and focus, and they're it's not where show they should up. be. Yeah, they're going to so show up. So what are we not doing that we really need to get on top of immediately? Well, first of all, I mean, there are a lot of grown-ups that say learning loss. We have no learning loss, and, don't, and we need we need to not talk in those disparaging sorts of terms, uh, et cetera. And so, first, we have to recognize we have it, and we need to triage immediately. Sense of urgency, and there are things we can do: tutoring, after-school extended day. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Right? Practice, practice, practice. So, more time, more resources, triage, and we know what to do, and we can do it. But Are you seeing enough of this happening? Not enough, I, but some places. But there's a lot of kind of the eyewash around problem what problem. There's a lot of money. Yeah. Oh, my God. Me and a governor right now is like having a bottle of bourbon, you know, a 14 year old with a bottle of bourbon. You know, <laughs> Not piece, that you know. Piece of the Maserati, you know, it's like. <laughs> So you have, I mean, billions of dollars going to schools, and yep. so what could you do? Um, some governors, Governor, um, I believe Governor Ducey has uh, extended, created summer school again, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, deal with learning losses. Um, Governor Abbott has created uh, grants, many grants for families with learning disabilities where the losses are even greater. Um, across, the, across the state, a lot of governors are taking some of this one-time money mm -hmm. and, and using it the right way. The other thing that I think um, is useful is that if you look at the pandemic era, public school student populations have declined pretty precipitously. Yes. Charter school numbers are up. Homeschool numbers are through the roof. 
Private schools in states like Florida where you provide, you know, we have a ESA and we have vouchers across the board, so private schools have remained pretty steady in places like that, but they've been in decline because parents were worried about whether they could make, make ends meet. So expanding options for parents on, particularly this week, which is uh, School Choice Week, National School, remember those days when yes, you were like touted all around the country? Yeah, yeah. Ed Commissioner, Ed Secretary. That's what I think, ultimately, I think creating a more um, parent-empowered school system where, where there are many more choices than they have today in places where they don't have it would be helpful. I think that's right. Well, so what, specifically, what do you think parents have learned over these past two years that's different than how they might have approached this before COVID? Well, if they're poor uh, and they don't have access to uh, broadband because of cost or because the service providers don't think it's economic to, to uh, lay fiber into their communities, they know that they are, there's a disparity here that is real. If you live in a rural area, the same thing. If you don't have a device, the same thing. So. Affluent places have done quite well being able to effectively teach for a short period of time, but the main thing is parents know that kids need to be in school. Exactly. I mean, and they need to be, in my humble opinion, they need to be unmasked uh, because you can't, you can't have social interaction if you're a five-year-old kid where you're, in some places, they're requiring kids to go out and do PE with masks on. I mean, come on, man. This is like, just it's, we've lost our minds in some of this stuff. So um, getting back in school, uh, dealing with these remediation issues, I think are, are, are good first steps. And parents now are aware that A, the, the online is spotty at best, and um, they also know a lot more about their school's education because they're doing their homework. Mm -hmm. Like they're sitting at the same table <laughs> Um, trying to help their kids uh, when they're doing the online course, and maybe sneak it around, like not, not in front of the camera, but they know more about social studies, math, reading, science. They're more engaged. Uh, and so I think th this is a huge opportunity to expand out the reach a little bit to get uh, parents more engaged because there's, there's more transparency now than there's ever been. Yeah. Yeah. This is so wonky, but I completely agree with that, and I think, you know, parents are, what you could, back in the old days, a parent could say, school is going to operate, and I know from this time to that time, and we're going to have Friday night lights and whatnot, the sort of re reliability, especially for, Jeb's talking about a family where mom and dad are working at home alongside and noticing and whatnot, well, if you're going to the grocery store and you're a service worker or whatnot, and you're hoping that your kid is home with the totally. older teenager or whatnot, if they're lucky, I mean, it is the, the, the no school or the erratic operation of school has been incredibly hard on, you know, working families. Period. Totally. And, and those kids are suffering mightily. And then so, when they complain, they get the Heisman, which they always get. So I, I think well, we're on I don't want to hear you. I don't want to listen. Don't, it, it, don't, you know. don't bother. We know what we're doing. You're not involved. So the, the frustration from parents, and this is playing out on the left and the right, is fierce and a moment to harness. And I personally think we are in a middle of a tunnel where we're gonna have a much more distributed system of support for charters, choice, home pods, homeschool, online, virtual, you name it, you know, a la carte, you know, licensed, whatnot. So uh, it's a in fascinating time from a policy perspective. You, and think I th it, you think it'll last? I think, I think 10 years from now, the schooling will look a lot differently, a lot different. I think it's gonna be more distributed, my wonky word. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Arizona, Indiana, um, Florida, all, or Florida's approaching 50% of the, the uh, parents have their kids, they choose where their kids go to school, maybe more than that now. And other states are moving very fast in that regard. To get to your point, mm -hmm. if, if parents can make these choices, there'll be all sorts of schools that emerge that could be hybrid learning, they could be pods, they could be a more robust uh, private school system. One of the unique things about uh, expanding parental choice is that the beneficiaries, uh, first and foremost, are the inner city community organizations that have been diminished over time. The churches, community organizations that set up you know, four-year-old programs and, 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 um, and K-12 schools funded by parents receiving a voucher or an ESA. That kind of approach, I think, would yield a far better result than what we have now, and we're, we're in the beginning of it. I mean, who would have thought last year that West Virginia would pass a law that, that is a, a, a universal 
education savings account. Now they're gonna implement it this, this year or next, I guess next, next fall of the year after, and they don't have a lot of capacity right now, but mm -hmm. wow, I mean, yeah, a, wow. that's the ultimate kind of um, sea change, and I think there'll be all sorts of interesting things that come out of that if they implement it faithfully. You know, the other thing that I see is happening is because of the accountability kind of resistance and whatnot, and, and the murkiness of being able to find out where your kid is on a reliable instrument and the, you know, kind of the, the empire pushing back on assessment and accountability and hoping to make it stick, is that too begets this, you know, let's just, let's abandon the system. We're for choice now because, you know, we tried to work within the system. We tried to find out. We tried to close the gap. We tried to resource it. Forget it. And I so, mean, I'm so cynical right now. Well, but. I was going to say, where are you? I mean, you know. We're marking you down as hopeful and optimistic. Okay, please do. I'm, we're going to lift it up. I mean, we've got a a lot of the work in education has been sort of within the system. Exactly. Are you in a different place now than you might have I think been? the whole system's in a different place. I think place. you need to set up a pod for about five kids and just <laughs> God. share your wisdom with yeah, them. That would be No, fun. hardly. But I I anyway, yeah, no, I, I do. I think there's a, a moment that is kind of a, a, worth the early days of a almost revolution in what the, the model. Okay, in terms of this revolution. Teachers, we can't hire teachers. They're not enough right. teachers. We'll We're, talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Um, Governor, you mentioned, you know, that, that some parents who've really sort of been pushing for choice for a long time still are kind of get si getting sidelined. That the discussion among probably middle and upper class parents in COVID is pretty different than some of the discussions for lower income families and the realities they face. So what do... As we think about, as people involved in education or as policymakers, what do they need to keep in mind as they make sure it's not just the loudest squawkers that are sort of, you know, getting the attention in all of this? Well, first of all, there's massive inequities in the system. In most places, um, most states have a multi, you know, huge number of districts. They don't have, uh, it's hard to get equal funding when you have that. So, prop, you know, property taxes are higher, you get more money. These, these, I'm not. I'm sure I'll text if they ever resolve that. But most states have this big inequity. So if you're in a if you're in a fluent uh, family, you can move to a place where the schools have spend more, or you can go to a private school. If you're a low income family, you you're assigned a school. So the to me, um, I mean, I've always believed this. I believe it even more now. If you want to empower people, give them the choice. Give them, make them informed consumers. Give them transparency about what what's successful, what isn't. Give them a, an abundance of choices and assume they love their child with their heart and soul and care for their child more than some bureaucrat that never sees the kid. I just start with that premise. If you start with that premise, you move in a totally different system than 13,000 government run, unionized, politicized school districts that are the organizing principle of our schools. So this is the moment where this becomes uh, possible, I think. I'm, I'm more optimistic, sadly, because of the pandemic, because of this increased awareness. Yeah, no, I think, I, 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 yeah, I, but I think that we had to have this, you know, uh, kind of catharsis to, to get through the, <laughs> through the tunnel with all, the, all these thorny issues, including a, a professional class, teachers that, I mean, why would anyone in their right mind want to be a teacher right now? So that's, that's an important point. We've got teachers leaving the profession. Here in North Texas, we have eight superintendents leaving their jobs. There's, it's not a lot of fun to no. necessarily be in some of these positions right now. What do we need to be doing to think about the workforce in education and leadership? That's a problem that exists not just, it's nursing, it's healthcare, it's across the board. There's, uh, our demographic changes are real and we've, we've basically created a static, you know, we're not re replenishing the, uh, the workforce. Birth rates, fertility rates, fa family formation rates have historically been going down. Now they're at an all-time low, and combined with that, you have a lot of retiring teachers because um, they're much younger than me, but old. And so that, you know, that's, that's happening. And so what do you do? I would blow up the schools of education because they've not delivered what they need to and create new ways for teachers to um, gain the professional skills of classroom education. There are a ton of people that have the skills, to the, the subject matter expertise, but haven't gotten a certificate. So blow up the whole system 
and allow for uh, alternative certification between states. Florida has that, I mm -hmm. hope Texas does. Most states don't. Right. Allow for um, you know, being able to get a certificate without having going back to, uh, to get a, a four-year degree in, in um, you know, elementary school education. If, if the schools, uh, if the universities thought this was a high priority, they would have already delivered more students, mm -hmm. you know, more teachers to the, to the classrooms. They haven't. Just the, you know, necessities and the exigencies are going to cause us to have to do the things that you're talking about. I would add community colleges and state, you got to consider, this is probably, this may get me in trouble here in Texas, I don't know if you guys do this, but why not have community colleges which are connected to um, aspiring students get, be able to go, uh, give uh, four-year degrees in these uh, areas where that's, there's That's mostly heresy around here. Okay, well, I just yeah. said it. Um. <laughs> the largest schools of education in Florida are former community colleges that are now called state colleges because they're more prestigious now. We have the largest alternatively certified teacher corps in the country, I think, or we used to anyway. Okay, let's talk a little bit about some of these culture war battles that are happening in education. They're not really about education, per se, right, and students, and are they achieving? You pointed this out earlier. You know, how seriously should we be taking these debates that are happening out there? Critical race theory, book banning, all kinds of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm as I get older, I get more libertarian. I don't like banning books. I don't know, I don't, I, you don't have to read stupid books, but Banning oh, books makes me really, book. really nervous. I don't know. Yeah. You know, you start banning books for one group, and then you say, well, they're going to start banning, you know, we can't read the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Or, I mean, you, th this, this could be a, uh, a slippery slope that goes to really bad places. So um, my advocacy is to recognize, I mean, if you've read a social studies, I used to mentor uh, and I, you know, as governor and afterwards for a while, I would mentor struggling seventh and eighth graders, because boys, because that's a really tough time for kids that are behind, puberty's kicked in, they don't know what's going on, they can't, you know, you, it's like going in an archeological dig to go into some, some kid's backpack that's really struggling, because it's very confusing, and so, but I, you know, I would always do the social studies during the hour and a half mentoring on Wednesday mornings, and the crap, I mean, the stuff in, 19, in 2006 was bad. I mean, again, I, I don't want to sound too politically incorrect, but Hiawatha got more airtime than George Washington in some of these books. So, and it's gotten worse. So, I, I'm sensitive to the fact that our, you know, that we need to have more rigor in in a recognition of our history. But I don't think I, I think there's a broader issue here, which is how do you do we have higher expect we need higher expectations of our kids. We need to make sure that our cut scores when we assess where they are are really at grade level. There's a lot of things that we should do beyond, you know, having um, legitimate conversations about um, how we teach history. And, and I think that broader, broadening out the lens a bit is really important. Because if it's just focused on this, uh, we're missing the point, which is what Margaret said, which is, you know, a third of our kids are functionally illiterate when they, and they graduate from high school, which is the great tragedy of all time. They can't go to college, they have to retake high school Re, uh, reading high school math because they can't take college. Maybe the colleges will lower expectations. We'll play like, you know, everybody's a genius, um, or we should have more rigor. And and to me, that's where the broader conversation ought to be, not not just focused on um, a, a very narrow, very controversial element. And I'm sympathetic to this stuff because I actually love my country and I think it's a pretty damn good one. And I think our history is not perfect, but it's the inspiration for the whole world. And we shouldn't ignore that, and we should be proud of it, not in a jingoistic kind of way, but we should, we should acknowledge it and, and work on the things that haven't been great in our country. But this debate is a little sterile. And frankly, I think, you know, educators don't want to be in the crosshairs of yeah. this stuff. I mean, we've got to teach the kids to read, not worry so much about you know exactly what they are. Well, we reading. probably haven't well served our teachers. No, I mean a absolutely, and so. Well, Margaret, you've had a little taste of this at the higher education level too. I mean, it's yeah, yes, this indeed. is real. Absolutely. I taught it. I was a professor. What was it called? Presidential professor of practice at Penn. Say that five times. Yeah, well, that's a lot of, they love those alliterations up there. So, um, I mean, basically, it turns out my job was to be a conservative on campus. Eight yeah, times the a, token. 
Yeah. I mean, essentially, no. I mean, listen, but at I least think there I've was one living for the last 10 years. There's, there's, like, <laughs> there's a lot, there are a lot of schools that don't even have a token conservative on campus. <laughs> and this ideology has embedded in every aspect of what they do. So um, it's a real issue. I don't know how real it is like for an elementary school kid. Uh, maybe high school, it, it happens some. But it's in corporate America across the board, and there are probably better venues to deal with this than, uh, than a classroom. Yeah. Uh, reading, let's talk about reading for a minute. Uh, you did a lot as governor to put in place sort of research-based reading instruction. Stole it all from her. We know how to teach kids. We to stole read. a bunch of Florida scholars to do the work too, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> we we have the research to, about you know teaching kids to read. We know how to do that, but we still are not really teaching our teachers about this. Um, but we are seeing places, some unexpected places. One of the unexpected places that is doing a really good job in reading and literacy is Mississippi. A lot of people probably don't know that. It's not the place that comes to mind when you think about <laughs> who might be doing well, but, but here are their results. On the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is the big national assessment we do sample, um, state by state, in fourth grade reading, they went from 211 to 219 over eight years. Texas went down three points. So Mississippi was up eight, Texas down three, Florida down one, the country down one. What were they doing right? They were, they made it a, a huge focus. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have reading first dollars, which Florida had, which was a huge catalyst for us. Yeah. And it, with all this extra money, that would have been a great place to put money, to yeah. teach teachers how to teach reading, put reading coaches in every school, maybe match it so that states you know, have skin in the game. But Mississippi trained teachers, number one. Uh, they created a ending social promotion policy in third grade. They held kids back. There was a sense of urgency of getting this right. They invited people in to the schools. They didn't, you know, as I say, do the Heisman. They, they allowed volunteers to come in um, and they assessed and they measured and they, they, you know, they followed it from K to three all the way through. But the, it had to be a public, you know, commitment by the governor. The legislature funded it and they had really good uh, implementers that made it happen. And it's still doing, I mean, there's still a, you know, it's sustained, it's a sustained effort in Mississippi. And, it gives me hope again mm -hmm. that you know these kinds of things can't happen if you have committed political leadership. You know the the joke about Mississippi is that every other state says thank God for Mississippi. Well, not anymore. Yeah. And I'm you know it warms my heart to show that kids you know kids of color, low income kids, if you if you really focus on this, they can learn because God's given them the same ability as everybody else. And the idea that they can't is frankly racist. Soft bigotry of low expectations Greatest is what line. we call that. It was the best line he ever gave other than uh, misunderestimation. <laughs> Strategery. <laughs> uh, just to, to build on this quickly, so they didn't train the, they retrained the teachers because they didn't get what they were supposed to get That's in right. the colleges of education. That's right. And it, the thing about reading is that parents, you know, they get, this is not complicated. Nobody needs to explain what reading on grade level means to anybody. Uh, so I want to tell a quick, quick story. When I was the president of, of UNC, we, we ran 14 teacher prep programs. And this is where kind of wokeness showed up big time. I mean, they invent in every one of the college programs, you know, what their methodology of reading instruction is. Um, and so we did sort of a, an analysis of all, the, of all the syllabi and whatnot. Well, it's no wonder teachers have a hard time being effective on day one because there's no sequencing, there's no uh, scaffolding of a program. I mean, it's a mess. And I will tell you that the best programs were those that were in our HBCUs because they knew what kind of kid they were going to see when they went to the classroom. Historically black colleges and universities. And, and um, those that were wedded closely with special education programs. Just saying. Yeah. And by the way, the, Mississippi, the other element that I forgot was philanthropy was allowed to participate as well. And I think that, given the amount of wealth that's been created um, because of the Federal Reserve's the partner of all people that own assets now, I mean, massive amounts of wealth. And instead of spending it on things that are, you know, very you know, great, grandiose kind of things, how about making sure that the other states can achieve the same thing and, and help train teachers so that they know how to, how to teach reading? Yeah. I mean, those, are, those, those would be practical. And, and, and I would add, uh, in places where the resources have been um, limited, uh, this, this 
ought to start in, you know, the literacy efforts ought to start in four, as four-year-olds, mm -hmm. which um, I don't know what you all do here, but that's an important part of the strategy right. where you assess early, you do the remediation, you give parents, you know, the tools necessary to help. There's a lot of, lot of ways beyond just the traditional K-12 classroom where you can make sure kids can learn. Uh, let's talk a little bit about higher ed. Margaret, you obviously ran a higher ed, a, a big system, as you said, for several years. Um, you know, are they getting it right right now? Do we have the incentives in the right place? Oh my gosh, how long do we have? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, this, this too is an industry, an enterprise, whatever, that's in great transition because, especially in community colleges, enrollment is shrinking. That's going to show up now in two years when we don't have any transfer students coming to our comprehensive public universities. So, you know, they have to figure out a new way of doing business. You know, consumers are starting to really question the value and the, the immediate use of a credential. And we've got a plentiful job market, uh, you know, wages that are, that are going up. And, you know, it's an it's a interesting and challenging time in, uh, in higher ed. I think, uh, you know, cr creating that uh, mandate around the utility of your credential is, you know, critically important right now. And not often something that we yeah. saw at the PPP program at Penn. <laughs> it's a great school. Just it's a record. fantastic school. But if they want to invite me back, I might come. I <laughs> be the token conservative. Um, I, you know, there's a there's an element of this that I think more people are thinking about now, which is what about all the students, the the young people, younger people, adults that can't go to college because they have to work, or they're married and their child, you know, they have a family and um, and they can't. They can't be a full-time student and they want to get a degree to allow them to rise up. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of ways uh, that you can do that um, by extending the reach of the universities. Uh, Michael Crow's a, one of my heroes because yep. he's, he thinks big. Some of the stuff, you know, if he gets one-tenth of the way towards his aspiration, it's like five times better than most schools. So right. his most recent thing is a million or 100 million students are going to be touched by ASU. Yes. So, wow, okay. Yeah. So and they're like now give you're it trying away. to be like Elon Musk here, right? So, but they his whole objective is to to say, you should not measure our success by how many people can't can't get into my school. Right. You measure the success by how many people can access it, and if you can you harness technology the right way, partner with the private sector, you can deal with these shortages pretty quick, uh, because the the place the best place to go to get someone who who wants to be a um, to get a BSN is someone who already has a degree uh, in nursing but wants to go get a four-year degree to be able to get a $15,000 raise. Yeah. The best place to get a teacher is someone who, you know, may have a liberal arts degree and you can figure out a way to, to make okay. that happen. Okay. We need to, t you know, be much more creative about doing this and recognize that a 19-year-old kid isn't necessarily the problem. It's the 26-year-old and 28-year-old because they had to get out of school or they never started right. that need, need to be retooled, get their skills. So it's career and college readiness in high school and then make this lifelong. Um, I'm not sure every, any state has really embraced this, but that's another place that hopefully in the future that will Big become change. kind of a high priority. You know, and brand is mattering a whole lot less. I mean, I'm, you know, people, employers want to know what do you know, what can you do, can you apply it here today? And so, you know, the fancy name on the on the parchment is much less important. That's why other ASU. Than, other than. Well, of course that. I mean, <laughs> this, this is the SMU campus, by the way, I might remind you. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow morning at 7, so we're, we're good. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay, a couple of quick final questions for you. You have both been working on this issue. I, I'm sorry to age you, but for decades. And so... <laughs> As you thanks, Holly. So have you. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Correct. Right. Um, but as you oh, think about sort of what you believed, what you pushed for, you know, earlier in your career versus where you are now, is that the same? Have you changed your opinion on anything? Have you just sort of become even stronger in what you believed? Reflect a little bit on your, you know, your point of view. I'm much more bullish on choice than I was 20 years yes, ago. You are. I really am. Because I thought, here's what was my 20 year old narrative, which was most of the kids are going to be in the public schools. We've got to close this achievement gap. 
you know, the, the, that, you know, parents want their neighborhood school to work, period, paragraph, and we're gonna double down on standards, accountability, transparency, resourcing, et cetera. And that is intellectually honest. Uh, and yes, that we ought to have consequences and things ought to happen when they can't meet the, you know, mandate, and that ought to include choice. And now I'm sort of flipping the pancake that, you know, we got to unleash this thing. And the thing I worry about is how are we going to know in a new distributed model that we're getting something for our tax dollars other than, you know, happy and happy parents, that's good. But how are parents going to know what their options really are in a way that is more meaningful than what we've done with, with school accountability? Governor? You know, I'm, I'm uh, frustrated because it's, man, this is slow work slow pace mm -hmm. and you think about it, it eight years as governor or you know eight years in an administration a, a, a fifth grader is graduating mm -hmm. or could have graduated or may have graduated with a piece of paper that's totally irrelevant you know that's the the choices we make in policy end up affecting millions of kids and if you if you're static and you don't push the ball forward constantly um, millions of kids are held back. And they may, may not, their parents may not even know that they're an eighth grade level reader and they get a piece, you know. Florida's graduation rate right now has gone from 50 to 90%. I can promise you, Yeah. I can promise you. And everybody's, you know, I'm proud of that, I guess. But I can promise you that- It's a lie. It's, yeah, 90% of the kids have a piece of paper. That's great, but they're not gonna go to college necessarily. Again, the, what's happening, I think, without a lot of debate is that universities and community colleges are actually lowering standards to, to, to create you know, some chance of a kid to go to college. And stay in business. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and that, that's very frustrating to me. Yeah. And um, there isn't the political will to fight this along over the long haul. I'm encouraged, because we work in about 40 states, I'm encouraged by legislatures, by leaders in the legislature, there are increasing number of governors that are tired of you know, dealing with this. The pandemic's accelerated that. So it's, I'm kind of re-engaged, re re-enthusiastic. Uh, is that like misunderestimate? Pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure I get a Bushism in there. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can get to a better place, but it is, uh, why are people marching in the streets? That's my question is why, this is like, if it's, a, it's a moral issue, it's the civil rights issue of our time, it's an economic issue. Um, how are we gonna compete with, with places that have really made this a high priority? Um, it's, the haves and have nots are created by a, um, a K-12 system that doesn't deliver the results. And so, that's frustrating to me. I don't know, maybe, you know, I, I just don't know why, I mean, people are logical. They're smart people are out there, left and right. Why aren't, why, why aren't people pissed off? Well, in Texas, we've solved our workforce issues by importing a lot of talent. And you yeah. have too, in yeah, Florida. And so, yeah. we've done a much less good job of our, yeah. our own, our own talent. But anyway, so the, the point is that the urgency wasn't there because we we'll take all comers. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, last last point. What would you all, what do you pay attention to in terms of knowing how well we're doing and what should we all be paying attention to, to know how well we're doing on education that isn't necessarily sort of front page of the news every day? Data, imp what employers are saying and what Jeb Bush is saying. <laughs> oh, Mark. I mean, the NAEP, I wish the NAEP test was done annually. Yeah. I'm not sure why, it, the, back to those psychometricians, they're yeah, like exactly. a little slow moving. Because yep. it would be a, it's, it's truly the nation's report card and the assess, the levels there of proficiency, a handful of states come close. Most states, there's a huge gap between what they consider to be proficient, you know, so they game the system down to what the nation believes or someone that represents the nation believes. And then you compare that to the PISA tests and those should be done annually as well. And you could see the progress or the lack of thereof uh, pretty quick. But I think ultimately, you know, the number of people that are going to prison, the number of people that are getting a job, the number of people that, are, that don't feel disenfranchised, don't feel alienated, if those things begin to subside, it's gonna be because of our you know, K-12 system getting its act together. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, Margaret, Governor Bush, thank you both for being here. It was fun to have you both in the Has been fun. today. Thank you. Um, thank you.
a, a couple of things for our audience but before we all leave. Uh, first of all, thank you to Next Point, our sponsor for endowing Engage at the Bush Center. We always appreciate your support. Our next event is February 15th. We're convening a conversation on civil rights. This really complements uh, uh, the exhibit we have upstairs called The Continual Struggle. Our expert panelists will include the artist of the exhibit we have, Brian Washington, Dallas Mavericks CEO, Sint Marshall, uh, Byron Sanders of Big Thought, our own Colm Clark here from the Bush Institute, and Laura Harris of NBC5. You can find more at bushcenter.org. Um, you're welcome to stop by the exhibit on your way out tonight, so please go see it. You can see one, of, see one of the pieces of art here. And then a final note, we have several of our Bush administration alumni here tonight who all worked on No Child Left Behind 20 years ago. So please don't leave, come up to the stage. We're gonna take a group photo with everyone since we have so many people here tonight. And with that, thank you all for being here. Have a great evening.